it's very easy because of the way we interface technology and the fact that almost none of it is without some bitter pill to imagine that technology is the problem. It isn't the problem. What we need to do is figure out how to wield it properly. And we, and this goes back to the question of, of markets. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. For this episode, we continue last week's highlights of previous episodes, except this time around we'll be focusing on academics rather than on comedians. We start this exploration with evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein and Heather Hein who were both previously professors at Evergreen State College. So let's go ahead and jump into that now. So your latest book, your most recent book, um, A Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, Evolution and the Challenges to Modern Life, came out about six weeks ago. And so I think a great place to start would be right there in the subtitle which makes me wonder how do evolution and the modern world relate in a way that is relevant right now for people? Well, in every way. Yeah. (laughs) The, what people don't intuit is that um, in order for adaptive evolution to function, in order for it to do what it more or less says in the brochure, which is adapt creatures to their environment, the environment has to look like the one that your ancestors lived in. To the extent that your environment is radically different from your ancestors' environment, then you won't be well adapted to it, no matter how efficient the process was. Now, human beings are slightly exceptional in this regard, or maybe even very exceptional in the sense that we adapt to new environments as part of our uh, our way of being, uh, our way of moving through time. So we're better at it than any other creature. However, there is a rate of change that is so rapid that even our extraordinary toolkit for changing with different circumstances is unable to keep up. And our contention in the book is that we live now in a constant state of what we call hypernovelty. Hypernovelty is that state in which the rate of change is too high for us to adapt to it. I guess I would, I would add the thing that went unsaid there is that we argue in the book, and we are certainly not the first to do so, but it is still a, uh, a remarkably unaccepted claim in some circles, um, including in many disciplines in academia, that evolution doesn't stop at the neck, right? That, mm-hmm. you know, our, our brains are evolved. And, you know, most people would agree with that, obviously, you know, the prefrontal lobe expanding is a product of evolution. But um, to argue then that, that our behavior is not evolutionary or our culture is not evolutionary is actually... Uh, black boxing uh, what it is that we are as evolved creatures. And we argue effectively, you you would have to be arguing from faith rather than from a scientific perspective to to say that. And so the the principle that we introduce uh, in the first chapter of the book, the Omega Principle, argues indeed that all of what humans do, uh, being downstream of our genetics, is in fact evolutionary, and all of you know everything cultural, including our our technology, everything that we produce is in fact evolutionary. Yeah, you say that culture evolved in service of the genes, and as you mentioned, there technology is certainly an aspect of culture. That can be, I feel like, a bit of a hard connection for people to understand how culture and technology could be functioning uh, at the behest of genetics. Could you maybe tie those two together in a little bit of a way for us? Sure. I mean, the fact is this really should be obvious to us. And it's a a testament to the effectiveness of a kind of miseducation that we all suffered through that that it isn't clear to people. But the way to think about it is this. You have a mind. That mind is capable of causing your physical body to spend its time in different ways. To the extent that our culture was not acting in service to our genes, it would be wasting their opportunity. So the genes would look dimly on cultural traits, especially expensive ones, 
that we're not specifically in some way contributing to the uh, propagation of genes into the future. At this point, we jump to another part of the conversation where we're discussing the feedback loop that takes place between culture and evolution. Specifically, we're in the middle of discussing how evolution pushes us to make a culture that is maladaptive and how in our maladaptive state, we respond by creating an even more maladaptive culture. And this begets a vicious cycle that we begin exploring here in the conversation. Since it feels like we're kind of pushed into a trap that then we create an environment that makes it hard to get out of that trap. I think there are, there are two things overlapping and it's important to separate them. The thing you're talking about is real, but it's sort of, it would function, that would be true no matter what was driving social media, right? If social media were, um, you know, open source, uh, nonprofit, whatever it is, it would still have this, hey, this is novel, I can't tell what's true and what isn't phenomenon to it. But it'd be a lot easier to solve because it wouldn't be running up against the business model problem. And the fact is, you know, it's been said a thousand times, um, but it, if the thing is free, you're the product, right? That thing haunts our interactions. The algorithms do a wonderful job of something that we've never been uh, brought in on. We don't know what they're for, right? We can deduce certain things. They're supposed to keep us engaged. But um, to the extent that this thing is clearly causing uh, us to lose the capacity to collectively reason, um, we don't know why. And one thing that is certainly a contributor is that the purpose of the algorithm almost has to be to enrich those who own it right? Not to enhance the thinking of those who are subject to it. It does point to a, a key difference, I think, between the types of examples that you led with, Brett, and that we're now talking about, which is that when, you know, Fukushima and the Deepwater Horizon disaster, for instance, were, um, yes, technological failures um, and social media can, uh, can be framed as um, not a failure in terms of the business model, but um, technology run amok and, and taking over the, the human brain. And exactly as, as you posed, um, you know, really taking advantage of what was there all along. So to put reversibility, to build reversibility into a system like um, a nuclear reactor or a, you know, a, a very deep water oil drilling rig um, is going to run up against short-term human time horizon uh, thinking far less, far less embeddedly than will a, a product that we are all using on a daily and even hourly basis. Oh, clearly reversibility is, is in and of itself a difficult problem to solve. Yeah. On the other hand, you will notice, I mean, it is the identical thing, right? You have people in Silicon Valley, people who were actually um, part of the team that build the algorithm having to outwit themselves, right? Having to set up strict rules about when they can interact with their devices, having their secretaries keep their devices away from them. You know, they've clearly let a monster loose that even those who know more about what's in those algorithms than anybody are incapable of resisting their power. So it's, it's once again, it's the same problem in just a new form and whatever the answer is, right? The thing needs a kill switch. Right. And I don't mean a kill switch that suddenly, you know, separates us all from each other and renders us helpless. I mean, the algorithms that are adjusting what we see and understand that thing needs to be able to be turned off. And, you know, the irony is most people don't remember this. You used to be able to know what other people saw on Google because the search was universal. Then it became personal, but you could toggle it to universal, which wasn't all that great because nobody was using the universal, but at least you could see what the uninflected version was. Then that opportunity disappeared. Now we have no idea what other people see, right? We have no idea to what extent we're living in the Truman Show. And, you know, I, did anybody ever think that was safe, right? Could that possibly have been imagined to be a good idea from the point of view of planet Earth? It's hard, hard to believe. And at this point, we jump to our final part of this conversation where we're discussing how technology hijacks our attention and keeps us coming back to it in moments where we'd prefer to be focusing on other aspects of our lives. So as we look to engineering that steady state that you talked about, um, how, do we, how, how do you feel, I guess, about 
technology being part of that without it becoming something that just as you said brett finds its clever little way to maybe get to heather on the beach rather than rather than letting us be free to create these uh, better systems well i think it's very easy because of the way we interface technology and the fact that almost none of it is without some bitter pill to imagine mm. that technology is the problem it isn't the problem what we need to do is figure out how to wield it properly and we and this goes back to the question of of markets um so back i don't know decades ago at the point that hbo demonstrated there was a different model for delivering uh content right a different business model actually this is even before hbo is the recognition that what came across pbs back in the day was of a very different nature to the you know three camera sitcoms on network television and so i used to say it's not the box it's the business model right there's nothing wrong with what comes across a television it can be a nature documentary it can be very very stimulating and informative and worth your time um and we are constantly in this, you know, there's nothing wrong with a cell phone. A cell phone could be the most marvelous device imaginable if it wasn't trying to separate you from your money in many different ways. If it wasn't trying to, to model you so that it could sell that map to somebody who wants money from you, right? These things are not healthy, but there's, you know, a device that can allow you to navigate any city in the world like a native is a marvelous device, a device that can allow you to translate any sentence from any modern language is a marvelous device. The library of Alexandria times a thousand <laughs> living in your pocket is a marvelous device. And so the real point is let's, let's get the business model back in its cage and let's figure out how to use technology in a way that it actually enhances us, right? Because that's what it's been doing since we've been, you know, flint napping stones. Technology enhances our capacity. This is a totally new phenomenon we're seeing, but it's not inherently about tech. Yeah. Are there maladaptive uh, side effects of technology that you would warn us to be particularly uh, weary of? Are there are there certain things that you are seeing as a result of the technological technological landscape that are very obvious maladaptive obstacles in the distance. Yes, you should be especially cautious about all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, Brett was nodding right away. I'm like, I have no idea what's on his short list. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> every short list, all of it. No, look, it's all of it. And the problem is, it's not that it's all harmful. Mm -hmm. It's that it's all risky because you don't know what's harmful, right? Um, and so one, you know, we, we talk about various different things in the book, like um, the extreme hazard that comes from carbon monoxide, right, which is completely odorless to us because our ancestors weren't in a special in, in special danger of encountering it in high concentrations, right? So carbon monoxide is a very simple molecule. It wouldn't be tough to have your physiology react to it the same way we do to carbon dioxide. But the point is it's a lethal hazard at the point you start engaging in industrial processes. How many things look like this, right? Blue lights, blue lights seem like, you know, they, we love them. They, the first time you see blue LEDs blinking on a something, it's like, oh, that's a wonderful little something I've just got. And the answer is no, that thing is going to confuse your pineal gland. So you're not going to know what time it is. You're not going to be able to get back to bed. You're not going to know what happened, right? So this is everywhere, right? And the real point is, look, the LED doesn't have to be blue, right? An amber LED is not as cool looking right? But it's not going to mess up your sleep, right? How do we sort? So it's like, okay, this device is going to need an LED. It has to not be flashing where I can see it from my bed and it damn well better not be blue, right? Though that's, that's, that's not a draconian level of control. That's just like, okay, that would leave me in possession of my own mental faculties. And I would also be able to detect that my device was on. The next guest we focus on for this series is Anna Limke, who is the professor and medical director of psychiatry and addiction at Stanford. 
the moment we come in this conversation is when Anna is detailing the ways in which the smartphone is a powerful tool for causing serious clinical addiction. So let's get into it. Sure. And you, you mentioned the smartphone there. I love on the blurb for your book, you put <clears throat> the smartphone is the modern day hypodermic needle delivering digital dopamine 24 seven for a wire generation. And as such, we've all become vulnerable to compulsive overconsumption. How is the smartphone playing into all of this addictive behavior or technology in general? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what again, what makes something addictive is quantity, potency, and novelty. And what the smartphone does is introduce unlimited 24 7 quantity, um, incredible potency um, in the form of new drugs that didn't even exist before, as well as easy access to traditional drugs like, you know, alcohol. Um, and then you've got, you've got novelty. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's such a key piece of it. We all have this kind of search and discover mode that, again, is, is fundamental to our survival. Um, we're always looking for the next best thing, right? And the, the smartphone just absolutely exploits that feature because there is this infinite world that's constantly being repopulated with these novel types of experiences, you know, and I mean, like memes are a great example, like no sooner has that become popular, than people are elaborating on that to make some new version of it, which is exactly what the brain wants. It wants that thing with a slight variation, right? And if you can continue to do that millions of times, then you've essentially we're all hooked, you know, we're endlessly hooked. It's hard to then disengage. That's like, um, Robert Sapolsky talks a lot about the magic of maybe mm -hmm. about how if you have something that's more around the 50% chance of something happening, you get, I think it's something like a 400% dopamine spike. Um, yeah. is that a lot of what's happening there in our search for novelty on the phone and the swipes? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, social media is a great example of that. There's a lot of bad reactions we can get when we use social media, but in a way that almost enhances the, uh, you know, the attractiveness of the whole experience, because again, it's, it's uncertain, right? It's that 50, 50 chance. Are we going to get a like, or are we going to get a, you know, this person's, we're going to cancel this person. And that's, that's certainly, you know, what, what drives it. Yeah. You talk about too, how it's the, smartphone in particular or social media is interesting because it exacerbates other addictions, namely our addiction to social connection, really. Can you talk a little bit about how that dynamic plays out? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, one thing to recognize is that, um, you know, having and creating social connections is is fundamentally adaptive, right? When we, I mean, we're social creatures and when we're in groups, we are more likely to be able to protect ourselves from predators, more likely to find, um, you know, a sexual mate in order to procreate, um, better able to use um, scarce resources. So there are lots of reasons why, you know, we, we come together in social groups. And the brain um, impels us to do that by releasing dopamine mediated by oxytocin, which is our love hormone. Um, and, and my, my colleague, Rob, Rob Malenka and, and his team have recent, just recently discovered that um, oxytocin actually causes the direct release of dopamine on dopamine firing neurons in the reward pathway. So that's a relatively new finding. So, you know, that it's, it's, we get pleasure out of making human connections and it's highly adaptive for us. But what, but what, you know, the, social media and the internet has done is essentially drugified that experience, made it more potent, made it more um, plentiful, taken some of the complexity out of it, um, some of the ambiguity so that it just goes, you know, right to the reward piece without all the work piece involved or the, you know, ambiguity um, and embarrassment and awkwardness and all that other stuff. If you don't like something that's happening in a chat room or what someone says, you know, to you or about you, you just go to another one. You just like decamp. Mm -hmm. So, um, so again, that's sort of, you know, the, the, that's sort of the fundamentals of what makes something addictive is that um, it's highly potent. It, it's um, highly available. Um, there's novelty. And then of course we can control it and, and being able to 
control and change the way we feel in the moment really does also breed this addictive phenomenon because then we want to do it again, you know, and then we, and we know that we can. I've always wondered if there was something about kind of the external memory that the internet represents that acts as a constant reminder of our rank, of our status, of who we're supposed to be, that really kind of screws up our evolutionary wiring. Because in the past, you know, you mentioned ambiguity. It feels like we would have more nebulous uh, emotions or thoughts about where we existed. Like, yeah, they kind of like me, they kind of don't like me. And then you'd go about your day and you'd kind of forget. But now you look online and you have exact records of messages and interactions that kind of trap us in grooves of behavior and and expectations that undermine our our happiness and our mental health? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think you're tapping into a couple important themes. One is the way that the internet and social media fosters this invidious comparisons between ourselves and other people. Now, people are hierarchical creatures and we, we always have been comparing ourselves, but it was to, you know, your siblings, your neighbors, and the kids you knew at school, or the people that you work with in the adult world. It wasn't the whole universe, right? So now, you know, now how can we not feel less than, right? Because there's, I mean, there are so many amazing people out there, genuinely amazing people that before we weren't aware of, which was bliss, right? Now we know about them. It's like, oh man, how could I possibly ever achieve that? But the other thing is that, people curate their online personas. So half of what you're getting online isn't even true. And yet we can't, we can't tease out what's true and what's not. And in a way it doesn't matter because it seems true, which again, then leads to this kind of comparison and feeling less than. So it's really fascinating because we, you know, we do have anyway, a narcissistic culture that kind of promotes self-promotion. And then we have social media, which basically leads to, you know, horrid, like constant comparisons, which lead to deflation and and self-esteem problems and feeling like you can never possibly measure up to whatever the standard is. So yeah, I I do think there's like, I think what you're getting at a little bit more is, um, again, these curated personas. It sounds like you're even suggesting that we ourselves have them too, right? Like, Like where we have sort of an online person or image, which then potentially comes to represent in our own minds who we really are in a weird sort of way because it's anchored to these like quantitative likes or dislikes or whatever tweets or followers Mm -hmm. um you know but but i mean it gets into something else which is really fascinating which is just the the virtual world. And when I say virtual world, I mean the world which we are all collectively creating by investing our time and energy in that space. As we simultaneously divest our time and energy from real life. So it's very strange because what I really worry about is even if we want to divest from this strange virtual universe that we're collectively creating there's nothing there's nothing left for us to to go to right nobody's there nobody's left in real life they're all online and and so i mean i do wonder sometimes like maybe it's in i mean i'm trying what i'm what i'm what i'm standing for is like hey let's let's be balanced about this let's make sure that we are still meeting up IRL um you know in real life and creating robust social goods in real life but but my worry is that 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 the inevitable you know momentum is that there's not going to be anything left and that everybody will be living online yeah do you do you think that has to do with the fact that there that the internet and digital technology in particular acts as kind of like a super normal stimuli and it's setting such a high threshold or or motivational drive that we are really pulled towards that space and then the real world can't give us enough dopamine to motivate us motivate an attraction to it instead yeah i mean i think you're hitting on the the key piece which which is again that these these a lot of these online experiences are drugs they are addictive 
They, are, they potently re release high levels of dopamine. They're highly reinforcing. We get caught up in them in a way that we don't actively perceive. And they make our real life experiences seem dull, boring, depressing, depressing, you know, devoid of, of like, you know, interest. I mean, you know, I see this all the time. Patients come in and say, well, I, I thought I was interested in computer science, but I, my classes are really boring. And I just have to push back on that and say, you know, I don't think we have any idea what you're really interested in because you're playing video games 24 seven. Who could possibly compete with that, with that amazing virtual, like it's not, you're not going to enjoy computer science while you're playing League of Legends. Do you know what I mean? And, 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 and I do this experiment with my patients and I'm telling you, I'm convinced that I'm right because of the results of the experiment in which they abstain from video games for a month. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, I'm interested in computer science again. It's like, yes, other things have salience when you're not constantly ingesting this highly reinforcing drug. And finally, we close our academic highlights with Oxford's very own Toby Ord, who studies existential risk at the Future of Humanity Institute. At this moment, we're about to jump into the conversation. Toby is explaining the existential risk posed by biotech and artificial intelligence. Which, yeah, biotech and AI, I believe, are what you consider the the biggest concerns in terms of existential risk. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And what is it about? Um, let's let's lead with biotech since we're already kind of focusing on a biological th aspect here. What is it about biotech that concerns you so much? Yeah, um, it's a. Uh, it's chiefly uh, the ability to uh, to create and to improve uh, pathogens, um, transmissible pathogens. Uh, so uh, there has been a line of research um, by well-meaning scientists uh, called gain-of-function research, where people take uh, an existing pathogen of concern, uh, such as um, a, a famous example was taking a form of H5N1 uh, bird flu, um, and this is a a, uh, a very deadly form of influenza. It kills more than half the people it infects, uh, but was not transmissible between mammals. Um, so we had the situation where it was incredibly deadly, but not that transmissible. You had to catch it from birds. Uh, and uh, a researcher uh, did an experiment in the Netherlands uh, where he passed it um, successively uh, through, uh, through 10 ferrets. Uh, and the idea was to kind of grind up some material from the previous ferret and and um, and put it into the next one uh, until the uh, the virus had been able to adapt to this mammalian uh, system, and in the end uh, created a, a virus a version of H5N1 that was directly transmissible between ferrets. Now the idea here was uh, was somewhat noble, was to work out what mutations would be needed, how hard would they be, and thus how close were we to to accidentally, you know, finding um, just through natural causes, a version of uh, bird flu that could infect um, human to human. Uh, but in doing so, it also created this risk uh, that this new uh, virus that was worse than, than anything out there, uh, that it might escape the lab. And there've been many examples of, of lab escapes of dangerous pathogens. Uh, so that's one kind of concern is well-meaning people creating um, these, this gain of function research and creating these new pathogens that are either more deadly or more transmissible than the previous ones, or perhaps in some cases more, um, uh, more resistant to vaccines or antibiotics. Um, there's also possibilities of uh, more directly uh, nefarious work. Uh, so uh, I'm also, in fact, even more concerned about uh, bioterrorism or biowarfare, um, where people uh, just deliberately try to create to like, things like this and then release them. Uh, this is an area where we've got uh, tremendous improvements in biotechnology. You know, we're, we're at the, a real boom time in terms of biotech, and uh, this, this really could be the century of, of biology. Uh, but the, the downside of this is that the d rapid democratization of biotechnology is also a form of rapid proliferation. And if we take some of the, the biggest breakthroughs in biotech of recent times, uh, such as uh, CRISPR and, um, and gene drives, in both cases, uh, within, I think it was, it was a, 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 at most two years of, uh, of these techniques being first used, 
um, I think it may have even been within one year, uh, they were being replicated um, within science contests um, by, uh, by students uh, at university. So you have this situation where one year, uh, no one can, uh, can use this kind of new advanced technology. The next year, only the very brightest person in the world uh, and their elite team can do it. And then a year after that, all of a sudden, uh, there are students who can do it. And the, the pool of people you know, is expanding very rapidly. And that's great uh, when, when they're doing good things with it, which is most of the time. But it does mean that the chance that you encounter someone who has um, some very um, uh, pathological psychology um, does increase. And eventually, as this thing grows, you're going to encounter such people and they're going to try to do very bad things with it. Yeah, I'm just thinking as you're saying this, I can't imagine how any kind of regulatory body <clears throat> could respond to something in a two year window span in terms of it going from, you know, cutting edge to fully democratized. I, I, how do you, I mean, do you have any thoughts on how you could even begin to push back against that rapid pace of, of change? Well, it's, it's a good question. It's extremely difficult um, in, in large part because um, most of the benefits, you know, most of the effects of this at the moment are benefits. Uh, so you've got this, this ultimately very good seeming um, uh, democratization of the technology. Uh, and uh, it's hard to get all excited about that as a concern, um, even though the, the small chance, uh, small but growing chance that someone uses it for a rare but extremely bad outcome um, could end up having um, you know, more, more negative effects than the actual positive effects. I think that's, that's unclear and no one really knows. Um, but it, that, that confusion and, and, you know, dual use aspect of it um, does make it very hard. Uh, in addition, uh, you've got groups like um, uh, the Civil Contingency Secretariat uh, in the UK who produce the, the risk register for the UK. And uh, this is generally a, a pretty good exercise where they, they scan the horizon and try to work out what are the, the risks that we face, how likely are they, and how, how high impact would they be. Uh, but recently, they've restricted the horizon for that to two years, um, you know, the number you mentioned. Um, and so in that case, they're not willing to consider risks that couldn't really happen in the next two years. Uh, but if you rule out risks that can't really happen in the next two years, um, then any risk that would take more than two years to prepare for, um, you know, uh, you, you're going to be unprepared for uh, when, it, when it comes up. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and its role in terms of existential risk? Yeah. Um, I think AI risk is, is pretty complicated and uh, also very easily misunderstood. Uh, so I've certainly... Uh, seen a lot of colleagues try to put a really nuanced view uh, of this out there uh, to to journalists, and then the journalists write stories about the Terminator, um, and uh, and then infuriates uh, all of their their colleagues uh, who are actually practitioners in AI. Um, th this happens a lot, where uh, where the, the the nuanced concerns get turned into uh, into very unnuanced um, shouting in the media, uh, with with a lot of kind of you know some common mistakes are, for example, that it would involve necessarily involve robots if there was some kind of risk, or that it would involve them in some sense, turning on the humans out of some form of resentment or something like that. Uh, but if we look at AI, um, and we look, you know, at the, the long history of AI, uh, the original uh, intention was to try to create uh, thinking machines or, or programs uh, that can do the, the full range of intellectual thought um, that a human can do. They can do all the kind of cognitive things uh, that a human brain can. Uh, and in particular, they can, they can go about some environment um, trying to fulfill um, their, their aims and preferences um, and to do so very successfully. Um, and this is sometimes called now artificial general intelligence uh, to distinguish it from the more narrow approaches where, um, you know, where in some cases AI has been synonymous with something like search or, you know, or playing a very particular game, um, such as the game of chess, uh, rather than being able to play all possible games that are given to it as visual stim you know, stimulus or something like that. Um, so a good example of uh, AGI um, or you know, some early system in this direction uh, might be uh, DeepMind's um, DQN uh, program, uh, which was a, a you know, pivotal example of deep reinforcement learning, where 
uh, a neural network was trained to be able to play each of more than 50 different Atari games uh, just from the raw pixels uh, and to, to play many of them uh, at a level exceeding that of a human. Um, the, that original system actually was training a large number of narrow agents because it was a different neural network that was trained up for each game, uh, but from the same starting parameters. Uh, but over time, you know, they've also worked out how to make systems where a single system, um, you know, a single neural network can be trained to play all of these games, uh, depending on whichever one it encounters. Um, so the, these are kind of general intelligence systems. So then uh, the, the type of concern uh, that people like uh, Nick Bostrom and Stuart Russell um, have articulated is that if you have a reinforcement learning system like this, um, imagine something like the Atari system. Uh, that um, is trying to maximize um, the, the sum of rewards it gets over time, like the, the kind of the sum of the points it gets over time. If such a system was operating in the real world, uh, then uh, it would end up developing um, an instrumental desire to stay alive. Um, uh, even if there was no emotion or drive kind of directly programmed into it to say that you've got a, you know, an urge to stay alive, uh, that would just come out of um, the, you know, solving the mathematical problem of how do I maximize the number of points I get? Well, if I'm turned off, I can't get any more points. So, um, so I have to try to avoid being turned off. Uh, and if it understood enough about humans um, to, to kind of count as being as intelligent as a human, uh, then it would also presumably, unless we very carefully hid this information from it, it would become aware that uh, that uh, in certain circumstances, based on what it does, humans would be more or less likely to turn it off. Um, and so it would start to, uh, to reason about this and to act in ways uh, that try to increase uh, its chance that it will be kept on and to increase the power that it has over the world in order to, to get more points or reward. Um, so this is the, the kind of concern. Um, if that system were only as intelligent as a human, um, then it may not be able to do much more than a, a, um, a dangerous human could do. Uh, but the concern is particularly if we had a, uh, a system that was vastly more intelligent than a human. Uh, and when uh, AI practitioners have been surveyed on the question of when will we develop AI systems that can do um, pretty much all of the intellectual work that a human can do. Uh, the, in a recent survey on that, uh, the median uh, estimate for, for that time uh, was, I think it was uh, about 2050. Uh, so they're, they're suggesting that this isn't just a total pipe dream. It's the type of thing that we're as likely as not to see, you know, uh, in the next uh, few decades. Uh, and uh, so that, that would be a big deal uh, if we reached the point where there were systems, you know, as intelligent as a human, and perhaps it wouldn't take long before there were systems that were vastly more intelligent, and these could create a lot of additional risk. So that's the basic sketch of this. Thank you.